Alternative medicine is certainly one of those issues changing the face of healthcare today. If uh, you look at your newsstand at all, you're going to see uh, the uh, issue crop up on cover stories very frequently. Um, also, at, uh, the books are uh, just coming out one after another. Andrew Wheel has one uh, that's number one on the New York bestseller list at the moment. Uh, Deepak Chopra, Larry Dossey, Bernie Siegel are all physicians who regularly show up with books on this topic. Another indicator of the uh, increased interest in alternative medicine is the growing uh, profit being made by its promoters. Uh, one study found that uh, Americans spent $13.7 billion on alternative care in 1990. Um, three quarters of this was out of pocket. Uh, herbal sales in 1995 were estimated at over $2 billion. Homeopathic sales exceeded $200 million. Health insurance companies are responding to this interest, um, and managed care organizations also, um, and re really planning to introduce alternative uh, uh, therapies into their programs. Uh, April of this year, the National Managed Healthcare Conference had a whole symposium on how to integrate alternative medicine into uh, managed care plans. Uh, one of these Oxford Health Plans has already launched their alternative care uh, program and the manager uh, t spoke at this conference, and I quote from him, he says, I believe that if the competitors don't listen to what their customers are saying and enter this alternative medicine market, they're going to lose a lot of business, and I'm going to take it from them. In more academic settings, the National Institutes of Health has established an Office of Alternative Medicine uh, to investigate the scientific claims uh, about these. Um, although uh, fraught with controversy over exactly what its role is, its existence uh, is certainly used to justify uh, the interest and funding of alternative medicine. Uh, in 1995, the first International Congress on Alternative and Complementary Medicine attracted over 200 speakers. Harvard Medical School has uh, a conference every year on uh, alternative medicine. Um, the uh, last November, the uh, journal uh, American Family Physician uh, devoted a number of articles to this topic. Over 40 medical schools already have courses in the subject, one or two of them making this a requirement for all of their uh, students. And uh, around 80 nursing colleges are, uh, are, uh, are known to have courses in therapeutic touch, which is probably one of the more popular um, alternative therapies. A number of studies have tried to quantify exactly uh, what this level of interest actually is. One of the most publicized ones was issued or published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1993 by David Eisenberg and colleagues at Harvard Medical School. And I'll refer to this uh, every now and then in my talk because uh, this uh, study is cited in probably every article about alternative medicine to validate the uh, increased interest and, uh, and use of it. Uh, his study discovered uh, or revealed that uh, one out of every three people in the United States uh, had tried some form of alternative therapy during uh, 1990. What should be of particular concern is that 70% of these people said that they didn't inform uh, their medical doctor that they were uh, pursuing these other alternatives. However, Eisenberg's article leads us to the first major difficulty in talking about alternative medicine and especially in trying to think theologically through this trend and uh, how to respond to it. Discussions about alternative medicine are plagued by the, the fact that we have a lot of uh, uncertainty about terminology. This group of therapies goes by a whole variety of names, uh, some of them revealing more about what the person thinks about the whole area rather than helping to understand the whole thing itself. Some of the most common names are alternative medicine, complementary, unorthodox, unconventional, holistic, fringe, natural, or new age medicine. Um, alternative medicine remains the most popular term, and so that's why I'll, I'll use it um, this morning. At the same time, uh, you may ask alternative to what? And we had the same problem with a whole variety of terms for uh, the, the other stuff. Um, uh, often it's called conventional medicine, modern medicine, scientific, orthodox, allopathic, reductionistic, physicalistic medicine. Um, I'll use the term conventional medicine to describe that um, 
practice that uh, primarily at hospitals and by physicians, nurses, other uh, established healthcare professionals. What's probably more important uh, in trying to understand this whole area is uh, looking at the practices themselves and the principles which they encompass. Eisenberg's study defined alternative therapies, and I quote, as medical interventions not taught widely at U.S. medical schools or generally available at U.S. hospitals, end of quote. This broad definition includes a wide variety uh, of, uh, of diverse practices. The most common ones were, as you see here, uh, relaxation techniques, chiropractic, and massage. But if you look at some of the other things that he classified as alternative uh, uh, um, medicines, you see there commercial weight loss programs, uh, lifestyle diets, going on down to the less popular ones. Uh, we have uh, vitamin uh, self-help groups like Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and we see that some of the therapies that we would uh, probably regard as, as much uh, more uh, um, unusual uh, are actually showing up down very low in terms of the use uh, by people. Things like energy healing, homeopathy, and acupuncture down around 1% of the people. Um, this is a consequence, uh, or I think this is an important issue when we try to define this whole term. It, uh, I think it's interesting that in the pilot study for this uh, same project, they also include, included prayer and exercise uh, in their questionnaire. Um, and 26% uh, of the respondents said that they use exercise uh, as part of their, uh, uh, their medical um, health uh, pursuits. And 25% of the people use prayer. Um, as uh, to deal with medical issues. And yet, for some reason, these uh, um, uh, researchers decided to drop those two uh, therapies from uh, their larger study and hence got excluded uh, from the final report. Um, so I think this reveals that uh, there is a real uh, problem with a broad categorization, and uh, they, uh, they saw that including exercise and, and prayer was going to just broaden the whole thing too much. And yet, uh, these two practices do fit into the uh, definition that they gave of alternative medicine. Other authors uh, have included um, even broader definitions of alternative medicine. One uh, list of natural therapies listed active listening and patient advocacy as alternative therapies. Now, I agree wholeheartedly that diet and exercise, relaxation are important in promoting and maintaining health. However, I question whether these should be called medical therapies of, of any type. This broad definition portrays alternative medicine as much more popular uh, than a narrower definition would, but that narrower de definition, I believe, would better capture the, uh, uh, the issue that we're trying to grapple with and the part of the, this whole change that I think many people have raised concerns about. Um, this broad definition also has the effect of generating support and acceptabilities, uh, acceptability for those uh, more fringe types of alternative therapies. In effect, uh, these other therapies, which I'm going to examine much in detail later, are gaining credibility and acceptance on the coattails of uh, concern for diet, exercise, relaxation, and such things. Another way to approach the whole area is just to look at the characteristics and the underlying principles. Uh, some of the most common characteristics that are uh, brought up and uh, compared to conventional medicine are, uh, are listed here. For example, you've got uh, uh, conventional medicine is this aggressive, uh, invasive type of thing, whereas the alternative medicines are a, a slower, more natural approach to health and healing. Um, unfortunately, most of these uh, uh, descriptions often neglect the fact that nature uh, is not just always peaceable um, and uh, that uh, many of the uh, herbal remedies, for example, uh, have, uh, have toxic effects and there's actually an increase in the reports of toxic problems and side effects from uh, people overdosing on herbal remedies. So just because it's natural doesn't mean it's uh, either safe or helpful. And then there's the reductionistic um, disease or organ focus uh, uh, that uh, conventional medicine is said to, uh, to have, as opposed to the holistic focus of looking at issues of mind and body and spirit uh, in alternative medicine. 
The uh, focus on curing disease is, a, is viewed as a negative focus compared to the positive focus of optimizing and promoting health. Um, the uh, magic bullet idea, or as was described yesterday, the techno fix uh, focus of, uh, of modern medicine is compared to the lifestyle approach that you have to go in and look at deeper issues that affect the, uh, the whole person. You've got the paternalism uh, brought up regularly that, uh, you know, in, in modern medicine, you, the doctor is going to tell you what to do and you better do it and submit to him or her, as opposed to the partnership that alternative medicine wants to establish with you. Included here are the uh, self-care issues. They're allowing nature to, take it, to have its own healing effect and uh, the issue of taking responsibility. And finally, you've got the cut, cure, and kill approach of modern medicine, um, as opposed to the relax, balance and be empowered of alternative medicine. And in trying to understand the popularity and interest, I think we have to see that what are being built up are two overall uh, views of systems in complete conflict with one another. That uh, conventional medicine is this big bad guy who's been getting you and uh, um, has, while alternative medicine is this kinder, gentler option um, that uh, resonates with something uh, uh, that's true to all of us. Um, and part of the reaction against the medical system, uh, I think, is, uh, is a legitimate one. We have uh, seen many things raised uh, at this conference even, uh, what I think could be best characterized as horror stories of what have happened in the uh, conventional medical system that I think we all agree has got to change in some way. Conventional medicine has at times neglected the importance of lifestyle and relationships, stress, spirituality. Visits to medical doctors can often mean long waits, lots of forms to fill out, impersonal interactions, embarrassing gowns, cold instruments. Um, the focus seems to be primarily on my body and what's wrong with it, not on me and who I am. And to the extent that conventional medicine has overemphasized drugs, surgery, and technology, as answers to all of our healthcare problems, it has to take seriously some of these arguments that are being raised. Another reason for the popularity uh, with alternative medicine, I believe, is the limitations of conventional medicine. As uh, Nigel talked about in our opening session, uh, sickness confronts us with the reality of our mortality. Uh, it seemed that no disease would be able to stand the forces of conventional medicine, and yet as we progress further, we find that we haven't cured all of cancers, we're struggling still with AIDS, and now uh, antibiotic resistant strains of bacteria seem to be making a comeback. Uh, it seems that the uh, great medical machine is just faltering and uh, uh, is maybe uh, not going to work. So when Deepak Chopra brings out books uh, with titles like uh, Perfect Health and Ageless Body, Timeless Mind, these resonate with the same mentality that we have had all along, that uh, I want to feel better and I want to have a perfect body that uh, doesn't have to give in to the limitations of, uh, of mortality. This is especially appealing to baby boomers whose uh, bodies are getting to the point now where they're starting to show wear and tear in spite of all the jogging, dieting, and uh, refraining from smoking. They've made a cult of personal health, have never liked authority, and want to make all their own decisions. Hence, alternative medicine self-care, self-healing partnership model is really attractive to them. It's also interesting that Eisenberg's uh, study revealed that uh, most of the people using alternative medicine are middle-class, middle-aged, and usually well-educated people. There are two other reasons that I want to deal with about this growing popularity, but I'll just mention them here and come back to them later on. And these are the influence of postmodern ideology and New Age spirituality. In trying to clarify our discussions about just what exactly it is that we're talking about with alternative medicine, I think it's, uh, it, it'll be helpful to divide the whole area into five different categories, because I think we can respond differently to each of these. So rather than lumping it all into one area, I think we really have to separate uh, it into different things. The first of this is what I would call complementary practices. Um, these are those things which physicians and hospitals have not been provided, been providing, but mainly because they were not seen as, uh, as appropriate issues for, for those professionals to be dealing with, not that they were seen as not important. These would be things like nutrition or exercise, stress reduction, 
marriage and parenting classes, uh, support groups, massage, spirituality. People are not being provided these or taught about them in the traditional settings like family and church, uh, community, school. Um, and this is negatively impacting people's health. Common sense and I think mounting evidence from some studies is showing that these really do impact our, uh, our health and uh, are very important in prevention of illness. Now whether doctors and hospitals should be the ones teaching these issues uh, I think remains uh, to, is an issue of up, to, up to debate. But third party payers are definitely making sure that they are going to be paying for these things or offering them because they see that they have a cost benefit um, uh, attractiveness to them. In this area though, I think the Christians should be leading the way. We must agree that people are not just bags of chemicals, but they're embodied spiritual, emotional, and relational beings, uh, like uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 and Hebrews 4.12 affirms. Any form of medicine which neglects patients' feelings, family dynamics, or lifestyle issues fails to care for the whole person. The Bible affirms the importance of these factors for healthy living. For example, Proverbs 17.22 says, A joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. These issues are addressed in 2 Samuel 13 and Proverbs 3 also. But scripture, unlike modern or alternative medicine, also states that we cannot have complete health unless our moral guilt is dealt with. The Hebrew term for healing was rapha, but this word was used to describe a variety of things like repairing a broken jar or healing a person or restoring the nation of Israel. The fundamental meaning of the word then is to restore something to its original condition and uh, abilities or to make it whole again. Thus God's activity as a healer is not dichotomized into physical or spiritual realms but refers to all of his work in all of our lives. Most importantly, this work begins with the forgiveness which is available only in Jesus Christ, and thus he is the only true source of ultimate healing, as we're told in John 6. As Christians, then, we should be allowing God's healing power to work through us and in us. We have the example of Jesus, the great physician, to guide us as we interact with others. Our view of all people created in the image of God should impact the care and compassion that we have for all. If we exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, which is joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, we will show a real alternative to the cold and impersonal ways that, per that patients have sometimes been treated. The second group of uh, therapies is what I think is at the other extreme from these complementary issues, and that's the whole issue of quackery and fraud. This category adds the intentional idea um, of uh, deceiving somebody or of uh, hiding the efficacy of something, uh, especially to earn a profit. While any form of health care is open to abuse of this sort, the field of alternative care is particularly prone to this problem. It's a lot easier to fraudulently sell somebody a product in an environment where evidence doesn't seem to make a whole lot of difference. Um, when a therapy focuses primarily on bashing physicians or promoting or promises you the moon, then I think we really have to be on the alert. For example, uh, it looks really nice to say no more drugs, no more surgery, no more disease, um, but I don't think we're going to get that out of a book and some herbs. Similarly, uh, we can get around these issues. Uh, do you know anybody who has uh, any of these lists of treatments? And uh, you're not going to be able to read them, but uh, there's everything and anything is listed under there. Well, we've got this super new oxidant for you if you do. Um, and uh, the, uh, the turn to these uh, fraudulent uh, uh, therapies um, is a real problem in alternative care, uh, especially because a lot of those who turn to alternative medicine are dealing with chronic illnesses or um, um, illnesses for where, uh, for example, a terminal cancer or AIDS where we just don't have uh, things to offer from uh, conventional medicine. Um, however, I'm not going to focus very much more on, on this issue because it, uh, it, uh, it is, uh, um, uh, raises another whole area of the fraudulent aspect. The uh, third aspect, or third type, um, would be those uh, scientifically unproven therapies. 
Um, these would be those things which are uh, based on scientific ideas or based on ideas which coincide with, with scientific theories and, si and other things that we know about the, uh, about the body and about medicine, uh, but for which there's not a whole lot of uh, supportive empirical evidence to back up the claims. Much of herbal remedy, would, uh, herbal medicine would have to fall into this category, although we have to remember that most pharmaceutical drugs uh, that we have on the market today either were discovered originally in uh, natural products um, or are slight modifications of things that we originally found in, in herbal products. So um, it's not true that conventional medicine has rejected natural therapies, but they have uh, attempted to make them uh, more reproducible and to uh, uh, make sure that there really was a, a minimal uh, toxic effects from uh, the ones that were administered. Other uh, issues that fall in here, I think, are uh, with chiropractic and acupuncture, where studies are showing that these really have a beneficial effect uh, with certain conditions, um, and that, uh, but that they remain categorized in the field of alternative medicine primarily because uh, they're, uh, more, they're sort of different to uh, what has traditionally been offered in conventional medicine. Um, I think this should alert us too in the whole uh, issue of trying to uh, categorize alternative medicine that the boundaries between the different areas are, are very fluid. And so um, I think especially like uh, chiropractic uh, really seems to be moving into a conventional therapy in certain areas, although we have to be aware also that uh, there's a great diversity even among uh, chiropractors in terms of what they will offer and the other types of therapies that they might include uh, with their treatments. For these therapies, I think we have to sometimes admit that we just don't know a whole lot about what, uh, what these do or how effective they are. And uh, it is in this area that I think research should be uh, conducted when there are um, uh, plenty of, uh, of case studies to indicate that there really is something here that's beneficial. However, the fourth category would be uh, scientifically questionable therapies where once again, there's not very much scientific evidence, but the whole theory is based on something which uh, is either a new theory that nobody really understands or is something that flies completely in the face of, uh, of what is established uh, um, by, by, long, uh, by lots of numbers of, uh, of studies. Uh, for example, here would be something like homeopathy, where uh, the uh, way it is set, or what, what is done with homeopathic remedies is that they are diluted uh, sometimes to the power of uh, 10 to the power of 20 or 10 to the power of 30 times, which uh, according to the dilutions for molecules, this would imply that there is not even one molecule of the original uh, herb or mineral remaining in the preparation. Um, this uh, just goes against the whole, uh, the established idea that we need to have molecules interacting with, uh, with our body if we're, all, if we're to have effective uh, uh, treatments. Um, here, once again, in, uh, more research may establish that there is some effectiveness, even though we might have no idea how the thing works. Uh, but uh, when it is based on a, a theory that flies against the face of much evidence, then uh, these uh, practices are going to, uh, I think, be greeted with much greater skepticism. At this point, after looking at the whole issue of science and scientific evidence, um, I want to take a diversion to kind of return to one of the issues that I believe is really promoting um, alternative medicine, and that's the whole question of postmodernism and especially how it interacts with the uh, issue of scientific studies and uh, evidence to, uh, to support various things. Uh, proponents of alternative medicine frequently make use of arguments which are based on postmodern ideology. Um, Postmodernism does not necessarily promote alternative medicine, but I believe it's like a Trojan horse which is bringing acceptability of alternative medicine into our culture. Um, postmodernism is a diverse group of, uh, of beliefs and uh, perspectives on the world uh, which are better described by what they're not rather than or what they're fighting against rather than what um, exactly they are. Uh, they uh, are promoted as those things that follow on after modernity which is the era of reason and science that uh, has uh, begun with the Enlightenment. Postmodernism dismisses the idea of objective knowledge or absolute truth. Instead, each culture is said to socially construct its own meaning for, uh, for reality um, and does so on the basis of uh, just uh, arbitrarily chosen methods and standards. 
there is not one reality out there that we're pursuing and trying to understand. So for example, the scientists attempt to understand the reality of the physical world the way it is, is misguided because there is not just one physical world or one interpretation of that world. There are many interpretations. And if my interpretation is true for me, then it doesn't necessarily mean it's true for you. Postmodernism denies the existence of absolute truth about anything, except, of course, the absolute truth that there is no absolute truth. Uh, in his book, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Brew Joy, um, an MD, begins by stating, and I quote, it may strike your imagination, however, that large groups of people perceive reality very differently. Many of these ideas contradict one another. The shocker here is not that these people embody particular uh, contradictions, but the more basic fact that no belief system actually represents reality. They are only structures, structured ideas created out of a small part of the human mind's potential. Dolores Krieger, a nursing professor and one of the founders of Therapeutic Touch, has stated, I quote, it is now recognized that the concept of multiple realities is valid. Therapeutic touch has benefit from being perceived in this more liberal perspective. The idea of multiple realities brings immense control and power. Dr. Joy goes on to claim that we need to come to, I quote, the recognition that belief systems are only belief systems and not realities. At this level of consciousness, we can create anything we desire. This idea resonates well in a society which places high value on freedom, control, and autonomy. If each of us creates our own reality, then only the individual can decide what is best for him or her. To do otherwise would be paternalistic, if not repressive. Any group claiming to have found truth which applies to everybody else is accused, accused by postmodernism of marginalizing and di disempowering others. Hence, postmodernism is uh, quickly accepted by pop popular culture and it, uh, accepting its, uh, its main implications like ethical relativism, and a lack of respect for standards of evidence. Scientists and physicians have frequently come under attack by postmodern arguments uh, for their claim to have some truth which applies to everybody. Your body is the same as everybody else's, and that's a, uh, a postmodern uh, no-no. Western scientific worldviews or paradigms are labeled, and I quote, um, male-dominated, exclusive, authoritarian, linear, and rigid. These give reductionistic medicine, which results in, I quote again, uh, continued disease, dependence on management with drugs and surgery, control over nature being a fundamental need of patriarchal science, poor quality of life, and tremendous cost to patient and community, end of quote. As such, scientific answers simply reflect male white European prejudices. I quote from another um, author, uh, such paradigms require, indeed on a subconscious level, they beg to be overthrown, end quote. Hence, under the influence of postmodernism, alternative medicine frequently called not for change, but for radical total transformation. Marcel Hernandez, a naturopath with Commonwealth, and one of the organizations bringing natural medicine into managed care uh, plans, claims, I quote, we need to change the way we look at reality, end of quote. Gene Watson, past president of the National League for Nursing in a, title in, in a talk entitled Postmodern Nursing, calls for a radical rethinking about health and healing, which would, I quote, turn our ideas upside down. Chopra uh, calls for a completely new worldview, which uh, will give us, and I quote, uh, the makings of a new reality, end of quote. Um, in this uh, mindset, then, anecdotal evidence becomes much more important than double-blind randomized trials because these reflect people's stories uh, as opposed to just being statistics. So the managed care organizations at this uh, symposium I referred to um, are promoting alternative medicine even though they acknowledge that there are, no, are very few studies to support the effectiveness uh, of many of these therapies. Uh, but they say there's lots of evidence that, uh, that uh, consumers like these and are willing to purchase them. Even when there is research um, that uh, has been done on some of these therapies, it sometimes doesn't support the claims of the alternative practitioners. For example, therapeutic touch practitioners claim that it can bring about uh, relaxation, pain relief, and healing, yet reviews of this literature have uh, repeatedly found that, uh, that this does not match the, uh, the evidence. Uh, which I talked about a lot yesterday in my parallel paper. 
The most recent review at the University of Colorado, however, uh, came to the same finding that there was little evidence to support the claims. However, this whole study was rejected as male-dominated medicine marginalizing female-dominated nursing. The influential text Nursing Diagnosis um, has dismissed the lack of supporting evidence and recommended acceptance of therapeutic touch um, as a way, and I quote, to celebrate the diversity among us, end of quote. If therapeutic, touch, or therapeutic agents are to be selected on the basis of diversity, then we're going to see a wide variety of useless and harmful practices being introduced. While we can agree with some of the claims of postmodernism, especially where it is critiqued mar uh, materialism and scientism and the rejection of spiritual concerns, its blind emphasis on openness and diversity and its uh, re relativism must be severely critiqued. This uh, emphasis on diversity leads me to the fifth category of alternative medicine that I want to look at, what I would call um, energy medicine. This is a diverse group of uh, practices based on a human life force or energy field that's uh, called by various uh, names like prana, ka, ki, um, or orgone. The existence of this energy is found, uh, founded in Eastern mystical, occult, and vitalistic belief systems. According to this idea, we are at our, our fundamental nature is not matter, but uh, energy. And so we have these uh, auras around our body, and the ultimate being, uh, who I am, is my energy field, not the physical matter that uh, uh, revolves around me. Illness has its origins in these energy fields, not in my body or in molecules that I would ingest or, or come across in the environment. The, uh, Transition must occur, though, between this energy field and, this, um, and our physical body, and this is believed to occur through these uh, spiral things you see on the diagram here, which are called chakras. This is how the energy gets transformed into physical matter. Now, belief in this life force is not just at the fringes of alternative medicine. This makes up uh, the ideas behind therapeutic touch, Reiki, reflexology, Deepak Chopra's alter Ayurvedic medicine, Larry Dossi's healing words, um, and hundreds of other uh, lesser known therapies. Uh, one proponent even claims, and I quote, no matter what therapies a traditional healer depends upon, he or she, she essentially is treating the life force itself, end of quote. Some claim that acupuncture, chiropractic, herbal medicine, and homeopathy also work via this energy field, although there are other practitioners of these um, therapies which look to purely physical um, ideas behind how they work. Um, in order to uh, make use of, uh, of this energy field, the practitioner has to be in some form of uh, meditation. So for example, in this state then, you person can detect that the, aura that the aura or the energy field is all disturbed. You can tell from this that it looks kind of messy and uh, the colors are not very nice looking. And in this meditative state, these practitioners can detect these uh, auras around us. And then the practitioner can uh, be involved with the, uh, with, the, with the patient so long as the practitioner is uh, properly attuned to the energy field. They can then remove these blockages or imbalances in the energy field. And then afterwards, everything will look much more uh, clean and uh, uh, sharp. This, uh, um, the re part of the reason for the acceptance of these types of therapies is the use of postmodern uh, rhetoric and wordplay. Postmodernism had its roots in, uh, in literary theory um, and is based on the uh, idea of reader-centered interpretation, which basically makes language out to be a field of play, they call it, uh, where new meanings can be read into words, basically becoming almost deceptive at times. For example, one book on therapeutic touch starts, and I quote, Therapeutic touch is perhaps the first form of healthcare ever utilized. Every parent since Adam and Eve has used this practice instinctively when he or she has placed a loving hand on a child to reduce discomfort, help heal a wound, heal a wound or alleviate a fever. Therapeutic touch is the most human of all forms of healing, using the hands to reach out in service to another person in a gesture of peace, balance, and love. Well, I agree that when my child runs to me, he or she wants to have a hug and that this is uh, really beneficial to them. But this is completely irrelevant to therapeutic touch because it is based on a therapy which has got no physical contact. 
Uh, what is said to contact is your aura field, and so you sweep your hands a few inches above the person's uh, body in order to have your aura influence their aura. Do you know of any child who would be comforted by a hug which doesn't involve physical contact? What uh, ends up happening with this use of postmodern language is that metaphorical and factual statements get intermingled and the effect is that people are drawn into the attractiveness of these ideas without realizing that they are actually being brought into a whole new worldview, actually a whole new religion. Uh, tragically, some Christians are even buying into these ideas on the assumption that, that this energy field is actually the power of God. Nothing could be further from the truth. Some Christians have accepted these ideas claiming that all healing comes originally from God and therefore all alternative medicine ought to be accepted. They claim that the resistance to alternative medicine arose under the influence of the medieval church patriarchy and under enlightenment rationalism. However, the Bible describes an intense conflict between legitimate and illegitimate approaches to healing and spirituality. When King Asa developed a serious Ill illness, he was condemned for seeking the aids of physicians instead of God in 2 Chronicles 16. Some have concluded that this means the Bible advocates only divine healing. However, the context is clear that the primary problem with King Asa was his re refusal to turn to God, not his going to physicians. It's also highly probable that the physicians referred to here were actually Gentiles who practiced pagan magical healing. Ancient Israel was unusual in that a separate class of physicians did not exist, um, and neither did the priests practice medicine like most of the surrounding uh, cultures. Instead, uh, they were mostly uh, concerned with, uh, with hygienic issues and, and uh, the uh, law regarding uh, leprosy. Michael Brown, in his thorough study of healing in ancient Israel, concludes, and I quote, it is likely that the battle for religious purity and monotheism militated against a thriving class of physicians in ancient Israel, given the idolatrous and magical nature of virtually all ancient Near Eastern medicine. However, Israel did, uh, at the end of the quote there, Israel did not reject natural means of healing in favor of divine healing. A number of casual references in the Bible show that the Hebrews viewed certain medical practices as normal and religiously neutral including cleansing, bandaging, soothing with oil and balm, setting fractures. Physicians were not viewed negatively when they referred to in Jeremiah 8. And in fact, Exodus 21 mandates the provision of medical treatment. In the New Testament, the healing miracles of Jesus were obviously important in, to his authentication, but did he you tap into a, an energy field that's now available to us? A number of authors have recently claimed that Jesus healed via magical practices very similar to these energy-based alternative uh, uh, therapies. While the New Testament spends little time dealing with these questions explicitly, a number of scholars have concluded that the accusation that Jesus practices magic actually permeates the Gospels and that an anti-magic uh, healing apologetic permeates these. For example, when Satan tempted Jesus, he asked him to perform feats that were common in magical folklore at the time. To accuse somebody of being in league with Beelzebul, as Jesus was, was the equivalent of accusing him of practicing illegitimate magic. Also, the words that um, are put into the demon, the word, the mouths of the demons in the Gospels, are found to have many parallels in magical incantations. In effect, these magical incantations are presented as illegitimate because of their demonic association and also ineffective against the word of Jesus. The early church fathers also frequently addressed illegitimate uh, means of healing. This issue was very important because of the cult of Asclepius, the Greek god of, uh, of healing, which uh, even Christians believed was actually responsible for some miracle types of cures. Darrell Amundsen, a Christian historian of uh, medicine, has stated, I quote, that this cult was regarded by early Christians as the chief competitor of Christ because of his remarkable similarity in role and teachings to the great physician, end of quote. Early church leaders were accused of harming their disciples by um, telling them not to go to see uh, physicians. Origen in the third century wrote, and I quote, uh, but let it be conceded that we do keep away uh, those whom we encourage to become our disciples from other philosopher physicians, end of quote. Uh, he condemns a number of uh, physicians using their positions to teach philosophy, uh, which contradicted Christianity. 
uh, notably things that included, and he specifies uh, teaching reincarnation and the idea that all living beings are um, animated by the same type of spirit, like much of these energy medicine uh, claims do. Clearly the problem to which uh, Chris was that uh, Christians were being exposed to other religions when they went to these physicians. Augustine frequently condemned magic, but he made a distinction between using herbs for medicinal purposes and using them for magic purposes. He approved of taking them for stomach pains, but then rejected their uh, use as a charm. Um, alternative medicine therapies are very similar to these magical types of practices. The common features found in, ma in magic are that they seek to manipulate supernatural powers uh, by speci specified techniques to meet the immediate needs of, uh, of individuals. It's little wonder that sociologists of religion, even 15 years ago, were labeling this movement as a resacralizing of medicine and uh, a return to magical medicine. John Chrysostom in the fourth century uh, lauds a, a Christian woman for refusing to use uh, magical incantations and amulets or little rocks um, to uh, treat her child. Uh, even if this uh, child ended up dying, he said that uh, these things, first of all, are not effective, and secondly, uh, this woman is uh, remaining pure and refusing to get involved in idolatry. Christians have got to ask themselves uh, why they're getting involved with these things. The power of God is not an inanimate force uh, like these uh, uh, therapies claim, and in fact is much more similar to the occult than uh, I've uh, uh, shown so far. For example, Dolores Krieger started this interest in therapeutic touch. However, uh, she did this with Dora Kuntz, who was then the president of the Theosophical Society of, Mer of America, uh, which is an organization devoted to the promotion of occult and mystical ideas. Uh, they still promote therapeutic touch actively. Um, early books promoting the occult frequently refer to a therapy just like a therapeutic touch, which they call pranic healing um, or auric healing. Krieger herself admits that there are occult elements to therapeutic touch and that it's based on Buddhist beliefs. Uh, she encourages in one of her books their students to use divination to get insight into the needs of, uh, of themselves and their, uh, their patients. She uh, admits that people develop psychic sensibilities and uh, that, sh and I quote here, she says that uh, many who undergo these changes of awareness feel that they can also communicate with and understand other, other sentient beings, such as trees, birds, animals, as well as human beings. And she goes on to describe how she has gotten very helpful information from a variety of trees at different times during her career. A similar t practice called healing touch is much more adamant about the occult connection. Here you see a diagram of a person doing healing touch, which is basically the same as uh, therapeutic touch, except off to the side of the practitioner are two spirit guides, which are to be consulted by the practitioner. And here we have a uh, postmodern, uh, I guess, surgery scene, where the uh, patient is having an out-of-body experience guided by her spirit guides and the patient's deceased mother is holding the uh, other end of the red light beam um, in order to facilitate resolving some issues that this woman had with her mother who uh, had passed on. The Encyclopedia of Alternative Medicine and Self-Help notes that the life force or prana can be harnessed by those individuals who sensitize themselves to various occult practices. A Reiki, an ancient uh, Japanese therapy, um, is uh, you gain your information there through channeling in order to understand uh, what's going on here. What's going on is actually the promotion of New Age uh, uh, religion. As Barbara Barnum in a, a review of New Age nursing spirituality has commented, I quote, is the practice of the New Age nurse deceptive? Do patients weaken conditions simply make them targets of opportunity? If New Age nursing is to care for the soul, it is also usurping the field of those perceived to be more prepared for that task, namely religious priests, ministers, and rabbis. Or is the nurse a representative of a new religion? I believe that much of uh, these energy medicines are deceptive because this is exactly what's being promoted. Um, and we in the church have got to be able to recognize this and to uh, uh, speak against it. In a uh, story in time, one of the uh, uh, people referred there made this very explicit, noting that uh, he had found uh, a, uh, a religion. If we as Christians are authentic about our witness and authentic about uh, 
the way that we are to uh, live out our life with God, then we will provide a true alternative. I think this has been done before, as uh, the uh, renowned historian of medicine, Henry Sigarist, um, summarized the impact of Christianity in the first uh, century on healthcare. And I'd like to close with his words to show us just what can happen if, uh, if Christians take their witness seriously. Um, it re uh, quoting him, it says, it remained for Christianity to introduce the most revolutionary and decisive change in the attitude of society towards the sick. Christianity came into the world as a religion of healing, as the joyful gospel of the Redeemer and of redemption. It addressed, it, it addressed itself to the disinherited, to the sick and afflicted, and promised them healing, a restoration both spiritual and physical. Had Christ himself not performed cures? The grace of suffering can be shared by the healthy through sympathy for suffering with those who are diseased. It became the duty of the Christian to attend to the sick and the poor of the community. The social position of the sick man thus became fundamentally different to what it had, uh, had ever been before. He assumed a preferential position which, had been, which has been his ever since, up I think until uh, recently. And we are called to bring that uh, restoration back.